talk about management of respiratory distress and we'll go into case reviews. Uh, I will take a break no later than 9.50 and then and come back to finish up. We have a relatively small group here. I know some people are watching remotely. I uh, invite you to ask any questions as we go through the talk. So this is my plan to talk about today. We're gonna talk about the four things that are necessary for gas exchange and how that influences our treatment. We'll talk about why CPAP is so helpful. We'll talk about the specifics of management of individual disorders and then we'll review capnography. Um, this will be fairly fast paced. I know this is review, um, uh, but feel free to stop me at any point. I'm just gonna pause for a second and step back and think, talk about how I think about the, the big picture here. So in all of healthcare, no one sees as much undifferentiated respiratory distress as you do. And especially those of you who are doing first response um, you have such powerful tools available to you that by the time the patient is getting to us in the emergency department, the presentation is often dramatically different. So we're very reliant on your history, describing what you saw from the door, what the, um, what the initial exam was like, especially the respiratory rate. Um, on the initial uh, data that you're getting, the pulse oximetry and the end tidal CO2. So this is, um, of all the things that we do in EMS, this is the situation where you make the most difference and where you change the patient's clinical presentation the most. So your assessment here is critical. So I'm gonna move on to talking about the four things that you need for gas exchange. This is how I put, put things together when I'm trying to come up with a treatment plan. So in order to have gas exchange, you need to have a patent airway you need to be able to generate negative pressure with the lungs. And that's dependent both on the muscles in the chest wall and the diaphragm, and then also on the nervous system to, to initiate that. You need to have surface area within the lungs where the gas can exchange. And then you need to have oxygen and you need to have the capacity to carry the oxygen and the capacity to carry the, carry the carbon dioxide. And so as we go through the different respiratory disorders, I'm gonna use this framework to organize how we treat about them, how we, how we treat them. Now, this is, this is not a perfect system. So there are certain problems like asthma where the primary problem is you're having trouble generating enough negative pressure because you can't get the air out, but people also secondarily get hypoxic. But I'm gonna focus on what the primary pathology is because that's where we're gonna focus our treatment. So the basic principles are that we maintain the airway, protecting the cervical spine if needed, that if there's respiratory distress, oxygen is uh, not harmful and, uh, and often helpful. I know that in post-cardiac arrest, there's been some research about normoxia and titrating the amount of oxygen that we give, but in general, in respiratory distress, we're safe giving, uh, giving significant amounts of oxygen. If there's any suspicion of hypoxia, um, then, you're, then you should be giving oxygen because that's one of the most important things that we can correct. And as long as you have a patent airway, a, a trial of CPAP is, uh, is appropriate and occasionally extraordinarily helpful. So why is CPAP so helpful? The reason CPAP is helpful is that it helps with all of the problems except the airway. So if you're having a problem generating enough negative pressure, CPAP provides that pressure. If you have a problem where you're losing surface area because you've got um, fluid in the lungs from CHF or from pneumonia, the, the effect of that pressure is to open up those airways. And so CPAP increases the amount of surface area that you have available for gas exchange. And then, because we're hooking it up to oxygen, you're also delivering oxygen with that. So other than airway problems, you can fix the vast majority of respiratory problems with CPAP. So how important is it? So in every, for every eight patients with severe COPD exacerbation that you put on CPAP, you will prevent one death. So think about how many patients you've put on CPAP in the last year and think about what a difference you've made in these patients' lives. 
who, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot, and I'll include myself in this. Who here was in EMS before CPAP? And so what, what would you say, I mean, in your experience, what's changed since we started using CPAP? Less tube, less tubes. And, uh, and I know we value having that technical ability, but if for our patients, um, it, is tremendous, it is tremendously helpful. And, and so it's not just that it prevents intubation, but it prevents death. And it shortens patients' hospital stay. So it's, uh, it's a tremendous, tremendous asset. The numbers are similar in CHF. So for every 13 patients that you put on uh, CPAP with CHF, you will prevent one death. And you'll prevent, it, um, and you'll prevent people from being intubated as well. So it's just extraordinarily helpful. To give you an idea what, how these numbers compare, so ask some of the things we do every day. So to prevent one, one death um, from heart attack, you have to give 36 patients aspirin. Um, to uh, prevent one bad outcome with, uh, in someone with a stroke by giving them TPA, you need to treat about 80 people. And so it's just one of the most effective things that we do in emergency medicine or in EMS. So um, any questions about what we covered so far? Okay. So I'm going to move on to talking about airway problems. So common causes, you can have the tongue falling back and obstructing the airway, foreign bodies, trauma, burns, allergic reaction or infection. So differentiating the cause is obviously key to treating upper airway obstruction. So if it's a foreign body that's obstructing the airway, for a partial obstruction, you're going to have the patient cough. For a complete obstruction, uh, follow the AHA protocol, including the Heimlich, and then if they become unconscious, the, um, the thrust, and then laryngoscopy in unconscious patients with McGill forceps to uh, remove foreign body. Um, if you are not able to remove the obstruction, not able to ventilate, then that is a case for chicothyrotomy or needle jet insufflation in a child. And this is a case that goes to the closest hospital. For airway edema, croup and epiglottitis, uh, the treatment is, is racemic epinephrine. One thing about racemic epinephrine is that, remember, because it, it has um, both alpha and beta properties, if it's unclear to you about whether this is an upper or lower respiratory airway, uh, upper or lower airway issue, you're safe giving racemic ep epinephrine. We had a kid the other day, he was a 18-month-old, uh, who was brought in, he was limp, he was cyanotic, um, he sat with 77%, and I could barely hear any air moving. And so we started with non rebreather and then gave him racemic epi. It ended up that it was reactive airway disease, and really all I needed was tons and tons of albuterol. But in that initial confusing phase, if you have to choose one, my, my recommendation is to choose racemic epinephrine, and then you can always narrow down to albuterol if that's needed. So for anaphylaxis, uh, treatment is uh, epinephrine, IV if available. Uh, and then I am if, uh, if that's more expeditious. Um, for angioedema, but either from hereditary angioedema or from ACE inhibitors, the treatments are limited. You want to consider early intubation in patients like this. You may get these patients at the only point where their airway is uh, intubatable. And then for burns as well, do you consider early intubation, uh, but just remember to get a thorough air exam of the airway. Now, we're going to move on to negative pressure problems. So these are obstructive lung diseases like COPD and asthma. Pneumothorax, where you can't generate the negative pressure because the lung is no longer adherent to the chest wall. Problems with the nervous system. And then we're also going to talk about hyperventilation here, where this essential problem is that you're generating tons of negative pressure. So obstructive lung disease, emphysema, chronic bronchitis that make up COPD, and then asthma. Um, there's a genetic disposition to, uh, to many of these things. Obviously, smoking is uh, the, key, uh, the key exposure. And then there are rarely some occupational exposures that can set people up for COPD. So the issue in COPD is that you get these destruction of these small airways. And so it's a problem with getting the air out. They start air trapping um, 
and so you, you're not able to get the air out. So in patients with emphysema, that's why you see this barrel chest because so many of the airways have been uh, destroyed and they're constantly air trapping. That prolonged expiratory phase is one of the biggest clues that you can get in that initial um, evaluation. And that's something that can change significantly with the treatment that you give. So I'm really interested to hear what your in initial exam was. Patients who have pure emphysema rather than a component of chronic bronchitis tend to be rather thin. And they tend to be fairly pink. They just make extra red cells because they're constantly hypoxic. And then they have this hypertrophy of their accessory muscles. In chronic bronchitis, the issue is that you have an uh, increase in the mucus secreting cells. The alveoli aren't as affected, uh, but you have decreased alveolar ventilation. So these patients have a larger component of hypoxia, but it's still primarily an obstructive disease because they're not able to get the air out. So they tend to always have a productive cough and an exacerbation that can increase. Patients with pure chronic bronchitis are more likely to be overweight. They can have ronchi. Uh, they can have jugular venous distension, pedal edema. And so these patients can be difficult to differentiate from patients with CHF. The, uh, the end tidal CO2 can be an important clue, but also that prolonged expiratory phase can be, uh, can be a really important clue. So taking these two together, your treatment, you working for position of comfort, if there's increased work of breathing. If there's any doubt, you're better off starting CPAP. And then you can intubate if there's a failure of CPAP. Even in patients that, I, that walk in the door and I'm like, oh man, this, person, this person's gonna need an airway. Like I don't think I can turn them around. I will typically pre-oxygenate them with CPAP. Uh, and so I imagine We've all at one point in our careers had that feeling. We're like, oh man, like this patient is getting hypoxic. They're crashing. If we don't get this airway right now, we're going to end up coding this patient. I would say since the advent of CPAP, all of us had that feeling much more rarely. Because even if someone's coming in at 85%, if I can get their SAT up to 90, 92%, um, then I've got a little bit more time when I'm passing the tube, when I'm doing all these things. And so even if your gut sense is, man, this person's gonna end up intubated, you're gonna, if you end up intubating them, you're gonna have a much easier time if they've been on CPAP for a little while first. And if you end up not intubating them, but they end up getting intubated in the emergency department, it's going to be vastly easier if they've had this, this trial of CPAP and you've stented open the airways, you've maximized their oxygenation. So IV access um, is helpful. EKG is, uh, is helppful, especially because um, they are, our patients with COPD are more prone to dysrhythmias. And then, uh, and then breathing treatments um, and, and solumedrol. Um, capnography is really important to understand interval change in, uh, and that gives us an important sense of how your treatment, both where they started from and then how your treatment is working. But remember, in patients who have COPD, they tend to have a higher baseline expired CO2 because they're always having, um, they're always having that, uh, uh, they're always retaining CO2. So asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder, results in wheezes from a hyper-responsive airway. If a doctor is seeing someone trying to figure out if someone has COPD or asthma, the definition is that asthma responds much better to breathing treatments than COPD does. So breathing treatments are helpful in COPD. They can make a dramatic shift in asthma. Um, there's typically a trigger um, and individuals um, have each may know their own and uh, so then there's a trigger and then the immune system becomes uh, overactive and then you get this uh, um, additional edema in the bronchioles so an asthmatic bronchiole is getting plugged and then so the issue becomes you can't get airway out bec you can't get air out because these small airways are plugged so Patients with asthma can, can crump very quickly. So when patient gets to one or two word dyspnea, if you're hearing that silent chest, 
those are patients that are high risk for, for crashing fast. Um, knowing what's happened before in terms of how quickly their asthma has crashed can be very helpful. Um, remember that especially in that point where the patient has a silent chest, you may not hear a lot of wheezing. So the, hist the history can be critical and just, and it, it can be really difficult, especially in the pre-hospital setting because there's so much other stuff going on. But if they're taking good breaths and you're not hearing air moving, that means they're just dramatically shut down. The peak excretory flow rate, this is obviously for someone who's in less severe distress, but it really can be helpful to mark where they are if they have a, a meter to know where they're starting from. But that's not something that you're gonna do with someone who's in severe distress. So because of the mucus plugging, um, patients with asthma tend to get somewhat hypoxic, but still the primary pathology is they're getting fatigued and they're retaining CO2 because they can't get airway out. You want to re reverse the bronchospasm, reduce the inflammation. So you're uh, maintaining the airway, supporting breathing. And so getting them in comfort, give, giving, getting them a position of comfort, giving them oxygen. Um, so COPD is less likely to be helpful in asthma than it is in other respiratory conditions, especially because there's just, there's so much air trapping that said, you're better off doing some COPD, doing some uh, CPAP in someone with asthma than not doing it. But you really got to make sure that you're emphasizing the treatments. So, the getting the bronchodilators in early is incredibly valuable. So, C, you can do if they're getting the if they're able to get the inhaler in, you can just do the inhaler. But if they're fatiguing, they're hypoxic, and you can't get them up, then put the put the nebulizer on the CPAP. Uh, solumedrol is helpful. You're not going to see the effects during your transport time, but we definitely will, will see that. Magnesium is extraordinarily helpful for severe asthma exacerbations. So for, um, for every eight patients with uh, severe asthma that you give magnesium, you'll prevent one hospitalization. So it's not proven to prevent mortality, but it definitely turns them around much more quickly. And many of these patients that get magnesium after a period of observation in ED can ultimately go home. Um, if they're failing with CPAP, then RSI. Remember, ketamine is the preferred sedative for a patient with asthma because it does have some bronchodilatory effects. Um, an adjunct to that, so if, if someone with asthma is having difficulty tolerating the CPAP, you have orders for both ketamine and Versed to facilitate that. And someone with asthma, ketamine is probably the better choice because of that bronchodilatory effect. And then for someone in status asthmaticus, um, especially if they're not able to get the airway, then epinephrine is extraordinarily helpful. Uh, that case that I was talking about earlier, the 18-month-old who came in with severe distress, ultimately ended up giving him uh, some IM epinephrine. And that ultimately was the only thing that was able to uh, keep us from intubating him. But then he really, really improved dramatically, and then he was able to get more med debs in, ultimately never needed an, an intubation. Okay. We're going to talk briefly about a one special case of upper respiratory infection because we're seeing more of it, especially because um, we do have a significant percentage of unvaccinated children uh, that we care for. Um, so pertussis, whooping cough, is very contagious, um, generally not dangerous for adults, just extraordinarily annoying with a really persistent cough, generally for four to eight weeks, but potentially deadly for infants. Uh, so the symptoms, it's spread by droplets. Um, symptoms uh, come on in uh, five to 10 days after exposure, but occasionally as long as three weeks. It can be uh, difficult to differentiate from another upper respiratory infection. But the thing that, um, may, that makes it whooping cough, that makes that cough different, is that they, they have these fits of coughing. So for a child, it's, um, it's these <coughs> and then they, that's that whoop as they're trying to catch, in their, catch their breath. Um, for adults, it's just these, they're just these really, um, uh, persistent fits of coughing where the coughs just get stacked one on top of the other. So you get this catarrhal stage. Catar is just the, the rhinorrhea, runny, runny eyes, runny nose. And then this paroxysmal stage where you have the rapid coughs and the whoop. Uh, 
um, and then you recover after that. So it's important to note that this is vaccine preventable and uh, this is now part of the tetanus vaccination. So if you're getting tetanus vaccination, um, it's the vaccine that we give now is Tdap. The P is for the um, pertussis. And so you're getting protected against pertussis. In general, people who work with infants should be vaccinated against pertussis. So treatment is supportive, um, but the, this is an important clue to get because these are people that we, uh, especially when you're dealing with infants, you use droplet precautions and try to limit transmission. Occasionally you get some wheezing with this and a beta agonist is appropriate. Um, and then in rare cases, children will require a man, a mechanical ventilation because they develop such severe respiratory distress from it. The spontaneous pneumothorax, um, it tends to happen most commonly in patients who are tall and thin, though it can happen to anyone. Um, they, in general, tend to be younger patients that this happens to. It's rare that someone has their very first spontaneous pneumothorax at 50 or 60. Um, that it's this in really intense, sharp, sudden pain. Uh, occasionally there's a cough or lift that started it, but occasionally it just starts on its own. And so then obviously you can't generate the negative pressure because you've lost the, um, the adherence between the visceral and the, plura, the parietal pleura. So the, the thing that's really distinctive about, um, about a spontaneous pneumothorax is that the pain is really significant. And, and I've been fooled before, I'm like, God, it just doesn't seem like this person should be having that much pain. And you, you know, the lung sounds are dramatically different and then you, then you pull up the chest x-ray and they do have that. Um, but patients with a large one, then they tend to get pretty uh, tachypneic diaphoretic pale. So you wanna manage the airway, um, support the breathing, and monitor for the development of tension pneumothorax. If, you're, um, if someone's becoming cyanotic, hypoxic, then those are the patients that you wanna decompress. Okay. You can also be, have trouble developing negative pressure because of central nervous system dysfunction. So most commonly what we see is uh, traumatic brain injury, rare cases, tumors, or um, you can get sedation from drugs. Um, narcotic overdose is obviously something that we deal with very frequently. And so you maintain the airway, support the breathing, uh, C-spine precautions as needed for trauma. There are also peripheral nervous system problems that can uh, make it uh, difficult to develop the adequate negative pressure. Uh, the chief among these is um, uh, you, this occasionally will happen with multiple sclerosis. Myose patients with myasthenia gravis can just develop this weakness where they're not able to get an adequate breath. Um, and then another situation where we see this is Guillain-Barre. And the typical pre presentation of that is someone who had a diarrheal illness, and then three or four weeks later, because of the antibody response, they have this ascending paralysis. So they start getting weak in their legs, but then, uh, then it travels up, and it can even paralyze the respiratory muscles. Occasionally, these, these patients wind up on a ventilator. And it's a really humbling diagnosis to make, because although the classic presentation, general rule in medicine is if someone says classic, that usually means like 15 to 20% of the time because there's so many different ways this can show up and there's a variant where it shows up in the upper extremities, but especially in a patient with a recent illness, that's a consideration. Okay. And then the last part of thing that I wanna talk about here is hyperventilation syndrome. Similar to pneumothorax, this can be a really humbling diagnosis uh, to make and there are a lot of things that look like hyperventilation syndrome that uh, can prevent as something else. So I, I suspect at this point, You've all seen this, the rapid breathing, ch chest pain. You can get this uh, carpopedal spasm. So here's a, a short list of the different things that can cause that hyperventilation syndrome. And even if it's pretty clear to me that anxiety was the trigger and I've got a blood gas that shows that they were blowing off too much CO2, um, I, I generally will list my diagnosis as hyperventilation syndrome rather than anxiety because there are so many other things that that can cause um, that can cause that hyperventilation syndrome so one of the things you want to be most alert for in ems is acidosis so acidosis from sepsis or um, 
or from DKA can cause that rapid deep breathing. One of the clues to that will be your end tidal CO2 will tend to be very low in a patient who's acidotic because they've already started breathing off a lot of their CO2. Uh, a patient who's had a lot of beta adrenergic agonists like albuterol um, can, uh, can breathe really rapidly. Asthma can present like that. Uh, the other one I would say, I'd say we would see commonly is that, that fever and sepsis. And there's some times where until I get the rectal temp, I don't know that it's, um, I don't know that it's fever and sepsis. And, uh, and thankfully that's not something that's in the protocols. Um, uh, hypotension, hypoxia can cause people to breathe rapidly. Um, pain obviously can cause patients to breathe rapidly. There's a physiologic hyperventilation that, that occurs late in pregnancy. Um, obviously, anxiety is one of the potential causes. And then uh, PE is another thing that causes uh, rapid breathing with clear breath sounds. And salicylate overdose um, is all, can also cause that rapid breathing because, you, uh, because the uh, acid from the salicylate in the blood. So getting the focused history is very, uh, very helpful. Just understanding if they have numbness and tingling in the hands and the feet, knowing if their uh, mouth and uh, or their hands and feet are in spasm. Um, but that initial data before you give them any treatment is really helpful in making the diagnosis. What was their initial end tidal CO2? What was their initial pulse oximetry? What was their initial respiratory rate? And uh, supporting the breathing. If any question, uh, provide uh, provide high flow oxygen. Do not let the patients rebreathe uh, exhaled air. If someone has purely psychogenic hyperventilation and they build up so much CO2 that they pass out, then they pass out, and then they will build up CO2 again, and then they'll then they'll come back to um, to a more normal ventilatory pattern. Any questions about negative pressure problems? Okay. We'll move on to problems with surface area, and then we'll take a break. So problems with surface area, the primary things that we deal with are pneumonia, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and CHF. So pneumonia is an infection of the lungs, most can be bacterial or viral. Typically, when we see that one part of the lungs, and you hear that one part of the lungs that's really crackly, that's most commonly a bacterial pneumonia. Um, you can get alveoli collapsing as they get filled with uh, pus. So although this is primarily the problem with not having enough surface area, you can develop uh, ventilatory problems as a result of that. And then we also see aspiration pneumonia, especially in patients who, uh, this is common in patients who are chronically ill. Um, this is common in, common in alcoholics as well. So the focused history, including um, the history of fever, the productive cough, um, seeing if you could pick out where, in fact, if you're hearing that one focal spot in the lungs where, there's, uh, where there are crackles, or you can even hear very little movement, but just in that one part, very little air movement, but just in that one part of the chest. So the management is to maintain the airway, support the breathing. This is another situation where CPAP is very helpful because you're stenting pe people open. And so whereas many cases, if someone has a significant pneumonia, they will get up and get, end up getting intubated because I can fix COPD in the emergency department fairly rapidly. I can fix asthma in the emergency department fairly rapidly. I can fix CHF. In pneumonia, there's fairly little that we can do to reverse the underlying cause. Um, but having had them on CPAP for a while, if they get to the point of intubation, makes it dramatically easier. Um, establish IV access. There's a comment to avoid fluid overload, but remember, if this is presenting as sepsis, if you've got fever, the suggestion of fever, tachypnea, um, err on the side of, uh, of giving fluids. And then you may hear some wheezing with this. It's appropriate to try uh, beta agonists. So the acute respiratory distress syndrome is something that you can see associated with pneumonia, but you can see it with a number of different things as well. So it's pulmonary edema that comes from increased vascular permeability. So in some ways, it can look a lot like CHF. There's a saying among ICU docs that the way, 
the way that you tell the difference between ARDS and CHF on the chest x-ray is that the patient with ARDS is intubated because it just doesn't get better. Um, so they're not able to get that fluid off. It can also affect ventilation as well. And there are a number of things that can cause it. In common, in common practice, the vast majority of times that we see ARDS um, are sepsis, pneumonia that worsens and develops, um, aspiration occasionally. Typically with burns or inhalational injury, unless they stayed home for a while, you're not gonna be seeing them in, the, in that phase. With, um, with drug abuse, occasionally you'll see someone, so say it's that a person who overdosed on heroin, um, didn't completely stop breathing but was down for a while, they can get some pulmonary edema. There's high altitude is a potential cause. PE can occasionally cause that. I would say of all the, the other things that we'll occasionally see, um, someone with really bad pancreatitis, just because of the dramatic amount of inflammation you get with that, they can get ARDS as well. Uh, there's someone I intubated a couple of months ago who ended up being on the ventilator for about two weeks, just had really severe alcoholic pancreatitis. Um, so the mortality from ARDS is extraordinarily high because it's typically associated with multi-organ failure. And so there, the question that we're trying to answer is what's the underlying cause? In terms of the presentation, the distant, but they're often very sick, confused, agitated. Um, you can see crackles, and often this is throughout the lungs. And so you're going to provide the appropriate support for the underlying condition. And so this is a case where, especially if sepsis is the cause, you're going to want to give fluids, treat them with CPAP. Many cases, these patients will end up intubated but we don't want to withhold fluid from these patients uh, because the primary pathology is that they're having leaky vasculature throughout. Giving fluids is the most important thing we can do. And so it's providing the respiratory effort and uh, CPAP is extraordinarily helpful. And the difference between intubating someone with ARDS right off the bat versus after even five or 10 minutes of CPAP is huge. Okay. so. With uh, CHF, um, this is a, I know this is a presentation that we're all familiar with. It can mimic uh, some of the other things that we've been talking about. Getting the patient upright as possible is helpful. They're often going to be in that position when you get to them. What do we do that typically, um, as we're getting ready to transport someone, that typically worsens CHF? Put their legs up. So just anticipate that when you put their legs up, you're going to increase the um, the amount of venous return that they're dealing with, and so keep them. You want to sit the bed bolt upright. Do everything you can to minimize that and anticipate that decrease. This is someone where it really helps to get the CPAP on before you move them. Um, do everything you can to stabilize them before you get them onto the gurney, and so. Um, CPAP is extraordinarily helpful and can really fix these patients very, very quickly. Um, the, if the systolic blood pressure is greater than 100, uh, first-line treatment is the nitroglycerin, and then you can repeat that times two every three to five minutes with caution in someone who has, who, in whom you suspect a right-sided MI and uh, in patients who are taking phosphodiesterase inhibitors. So those are the drugs for erectile dysfunction like Viagra and Cialis. And the, the change with this can be really dramatic. And the doses of nitroglycerin can be fairly high. Typically in the emergency department, I'm gonna be giving these patients very frequent doses of sublingual nitroglycerin while I'm getting the drip ready. And whereas for acute coronary syndrome, you may start the drip of nitro at about five mics um, five mics per minute. In someone who's in severe CHF, we'll start at like 50 to 100. The doses of, of nitro are uh, much more significant. As you recall from August, that Lasix is no longer in the protocol for this. Vast, the first line treatment is um, to get the CPAP and to get them uh, vasodilated. What you do with the vasodilation is you increase the amount of surface area available in the lungs, and then you tend Typically in someone with CHF, the kidneys are not very well perfused, but once you venodilate them, then you get the kidneys better perfused. And so we'll give Lasix in the emergency department, but if they've had a good trial of nitrates before that, the Lasix is gonna to tend to be much more effective. 
Any questions about surface area problems? Okay, let's, let's take a 10 minute break and come back at uh, 50 minutes after the hour. Problems with oxygen and carrying capacity. So we most commonly encounter this in EMS, talking about toxic inhalations, including carbon monoxide, and then pulmonary embolism, which affects the ability to carry oxygen. So toxic inhalations can include heated air, chemical irritants, steam, and you can have airway obst obstruction with edema and laryngospasm. Um, but depending on the toxin, you can also impair the ability of oxygen to get into the blood. So obviously the uh, first step is to protect yourself and to ensure that you're not transporting any uh, potentially toxic uh, materials, um, having early contact with medical control or poison control, maintaining the airway, giving fluids if there's wheezing, treating with bronchodilators, and then specific therapies uh, for chlorine gas, humidified 100% oxygen, be helpful because of the um, airway irritation that you get because of that. So cyanide, as in with the house fire, you're gonna see patients who are uh, altered seizures or coma to Kipnik. Um, you want to give them as much oxygen as possible, um, assist ventilations, and then you can give uh, sodium thiosulfate. And what you're doing essentially with this is you're giving, uh, giving back the ability to carry that oxygen to the tissues again. With hydrogen sulfide, you can't see respiratory depression. You're going to assist ventilations, and then uh, you may see seizures associated with that as well. For carbon monoxide, this is something where in the emergency department, we're very dependent on your pre-hospital assessment of what's going on, both from the data about the CO to just the history about the house and what was going on and how many people are affected. So it's an odorless, colorless gas. Remember, we're getting, although it's been pretty hot, by the time the next lecture, hopefully we'll have some cold days. Maybe people will even turn their uh, furnace on. And so that's when we often tend to see problems with carbon monoxide. Um, it can build up in confined spaces. Um, people um, will um, occasionally attempt to commit suicide. Um, and obviously it poses a hazard to you. And so the issue with carbon monoxide is that it displaces the oxygen from he the hemoglobin. It binds with greater affinity than oxygen does, and so it creates cellular hypoxia. What's the pulse oximeter going to say in someone with CO poisoning? Okay. It's going to be very high. So getting the history, um, the, and the key thing with uh, CO poisoning is that you're often going to have multiple people at the same site who are complaining of similar symptoms. And so uh, if, if this is suspected, um, giving oxygen um, by 100% by non-rebreather non mask, um, getting the CO level is extraordinarily helpful. Um, if there's, for example, a house fire suspicion of cyanide, you want to get the CO level before you give uh, the sodium thiosulfate. Um, and then uh, de depending on the level of CO, um, that will uh, give you some indication as to where, where you need to go. So any kind of neurologic symptoms, you're going to go to the emergency department. If you've got a significant poisoning with a level greater than 25%, then contact medical control because that's someone who will likely be diverted to a hyperbaric chamber. Uh, remember an EKG because patients are developing um, and can develop this tissue hypoxia, and so they can have um, ischemia as a result of that. It's like an induced anemia. So with pulmonary embolism, the issue is obstruction of a pulmonary artery. So remember that addition, in addition to blood clot, um, it can be air in someone who's had trauma, uh, air or fat in someone who's had recent trauma, especially like lower extremity trauma, um, amniotic fluid in someone who has recently delivered, rarely uh, foreign bodies. But the common risk factors are anything that increases the blood's likelihood to clot. So having had a recent surgery, having had recent trauma, um, being pregnant because the body is preparing to deliver 
it's a hypercoagulable state. Um, oral contraceptives are a significant risk factor uh, because those are the same hormones that the body is exposed to in pregnancy. And then tobacco use is a significant risk factor. A handful of others like prolonged travel. So the uh, assessment can be really helpful. And uh, this is occasionally a patient you find down um, in a cast and severely short of breath. Thankfully, my surgery has a very low risk of PE, but keep that in mind if you find me. And uh, um, you can have a cough with PE, and occasionally that's the only presenting symptom, and it can occasionally be a, a, a blood-tinged cough. So that's one of the questions we ask if we're trying to determine if we need to work someone up for PE is, was, was there hemoptysis? In significant PE, you can have signs of right heart failure. So it's just, just as people with COPD develop um, core pulmonal over time because for uh, over years the right heart has additional work to do pushing against um, the increased airspace in the lungs. With PE you're developing sudden right heart strain and so you can see jugular venous distension, you can see significant hypotension, um, and then uh, you can see a swollen extremity. This is typically in one extremity. It's very rare to have bilateral DVTs. It happens, but especially the person who has one swollen extremity, that's a situation where you think about DVT. So maintaining the airway, supporting the breathing. Um, patients with large pulmonary emboli may need intubation. Um, IV access is critical. and. Uh, <coughs> monitoring the vital signs because occasionally that developing hypotension is the is that sign that we have so typically they become more and more tachycardic and then they become more hypertensive uh, excuse me hypotensive and uh, and then that's when someone with a significant PE will crash any questions about problems with oxygen oxygen delivery okay. the other presentation that you'll see is someone with anemia um, can appear short of breath just because they don't have adequate carrying capacity. That's not something that um, without blood you have the ability to treat, but being aware someone who's pale, someone who has a history of blood loss, they can also appear um, really short of breath um, just because they don't have adequate carrying capacity. So we'll do a brief review of uh, capnography and then we'll, then we'll be done with this. We'll move into case reviews. <coughs> So entitled CO2 is a non-invasive measurement of the exhaled carbon dioxide. The capnograph is a visual recording of how the waveform progresses over time. You get both the information from the waveform breath by breath and what that peak is, but then you also get critical information about how the expired um, carbon dioxide is changing over time. It gives you instantaneous information about metabolism, about how well the body is producing CO2. So clinically in, uh, in uh, cardiac arrest, obviously that, that can be a key finding. It gives you information about perfusion. Um, you need to be pumping the blood to be able to get the CO2 into the lungs. And then it gives you information about ventilation, how, how well it's being eliminated. But you can, if someone's having a significant difficulty um, getting CO2 out, then you're going to have a low reading on the, uh, on the end tidal CO2, even though in their body they may have very high levels of CO2. The example of that is, say, someone who either we sedate in the emergency department or, say, someone who sedates themselves with uh, alcohol or other drugs. Um, they will build up CO2, and then, then they become apneic, and so the CO2 reading can drop to zero because they're not putting anything out. But then once they get a breath, the reading is going to be very high because they've been building up CO2 that whole time. So the normal um, CO2 waveform, this place from A to B, is the exhalation of gas that's free of carbon dioxide from the dead space. And then in this portion from B to C, you're getting a combination of dead space and alveolar gases. From C to D, that's where the majority of the CO2 is exhaled. So this is mostly alveolar gas coming out. And then D is the end tidal point. So that one number that you're getting on the CO2 monitor reflects the value at D. It's the peak there. And then from D to E, you have inspiration, 
the expired CO2 falls back to the baseline. So in cardiac arrest, it can give you important information about the quality of the CPR because it tells you how well you are perfusing the myocardium. And so when you have a jump of 20 millimeters of mercury in the entitled CO2, that's a powerful indicator that you have return of spontaneous circulation. And if you're getting CO2 levels less than 20 millimeters of mercury, especially in a fresh arrest, um, then that's an indication that you may have adequate in, uh, inadequate chest to, to compression or rate. It can give you valuable information about the prognosis as an entitled CO2. So if you have high quality CPR and the entitled CO2 is persistently less than 10 millimeters of mercury, uh, the return of spontaneous circulation is unlikely. And especially if you're 20 minutes in and you're still getting that, then uh, that is a very poor prognostic indicator. Um, and so obviously you're going to be in a much better situation if you come upon an arrest and you find that the end tidal CO2 is 20 or 30. Um, you can come upon someone, find the end tidal CO2 um, very low, and then with good CPR get a quick return but it's a, a poor prognostic indicator if the initial and tidal CO2 is very low. So it is the, uh, the gold standard for verifying and continuously verifying uh, endotracheal tube placement. Um, you want a uh, continuous, um, continuous waveform. But remember, you can see this in right main stem intubation as well. So remember to check uh, breath sounds as well. It, this is not, so entitled CO2 is not going to tell you as much about a right main stem intubation because you may see them hypoxic, but with a fairly normal CO2 waveform. So if you have a flatline waveform, then either it's esophageal placement or you have prolonged cardiac arrest, uh, there's inadequate blood flow, or there's some kind of obstruction. Um, if there's any doubt, pull the tube. And then, although the numbers aren't directly comparable from a supraglottic airway to an endotracheal tube, it can give you some valuable information about how well your eye gel is working to ventilate the patient. So for the intubated patient, uh, we use it to provide continuous monitoring of tube location. And then in patients with suspected increased intracranial pressure, um, both hypo, hyper and hypoventilation can be detrimental. You want to target a normal and tidal CO2 in head injured patients in the range of roughly 35. So in, uh, in patients who have COPD, um, it will give you this clue that they're significantly building up uh, CO2, they're building up CO2 and they're not breathing adequately. And so Remember, because COPD is primarily an obstructive problem, if you have them on oxygen, you may not see the signs of impending failure because you're correcting the issue with the oxygen, but you're not correcting the issue with the ventilation. So a climbing and tidal CO2 in someone with uh, COPD is a poor, poor predictor. And, uh, and then monitoring that CO2 will allow you to keep adequate um, oxygenation without worrying about making them hypoventilate. So it's some, something that's important to continuously monitor. The cat, I would add to that in patients who have sedated themselves with uh, narcotics or other medications, it's a really uh, valuable, valuable monitoring tool. In asthma, um, it can be uh, it's something that you can use to track the severity. Um, so with asthma, they will tend to compensate over time, and they can get this very low CO2. But as as it worse as the asthma worsens and they retain, they're going to go from low CO2. So say they're around 20, 25. When they go back up to normal, that's actually a sign that they're failing. Because with asthma, you typically they're not chronic retainers. They have the time to compensate. They do compensate, and then when they stop compensating, they go back to normal. And then when they go above normal then with an asthmatic, that's a sign that they're very close to uh, respiratory collapse. Any, um, any questions about entitled CO2? Okay. Uh, so, so just to review, okay. so we reviewed um, dealing with problems with the airway, 
So what's the, what's the treatment for croup or epiglottitis? What's the dose for a child less than 20 kilograms? Um, what are some problems with negative pressure? When a patient can't add a, generate enough negative pressure to, for ventilation? So CPAP is the treatment, and so you can see this with obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, you can see that with someone who, like with myasthenia gravis, who can't generate enough negative force. Um, what's, uh, what are some pathologies that cause limited surface area for gas exchange? Emphysema, emphysema can limit surface exchange, cause some hypoxia. What, what are the situations where lack of surface area is the primary problem? Pneumonia, ARDS, and, and CHF. And then we reviewed problems with oxygen and carrying capacity. Um, so patients who uh, are not able to transport oxygen because of toxic inhalation or don't have the carrying capacity because of uh, CO2. So that's, that's all I have in that talk. Thank you. And then, Dr. Whitwood, would you like to do the case review? OK. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> I was going to say I'll step away, but I can't really. I'll yeah. just roll away. <laughs> Good to see you. Okay. Um, anybody have any questions or anything that we need to check on before we go to case reviews? Thank you, Marlo. Okay, first, first patient, 43-year-old uh, male, chief complaint of abdominal pain, um, alert and oriented times four, mild to moderate distress, airways patent, uh, vitals were normal, weak radial pulse, patient was very hypotensive on the first vitals check. Um, quote, diagnosed with a stomach infection two days ago, which is when the abdominal pain and chest pain first began. Describes both painful areas as sharp, constant, and rated 10 of 10. Feels weak, nauseated, etc. Denies significant past history. Although he said he had an unknown stomach infection, and then he said he had a history of TB and a pulmonary or slash fungal infection. Uh, IV established. I should say that he was picked up like essentially at the share house. Um, IV established patients started on a fluid bolus, got some Zofran for nausea, says the pains are worse, uh, en route, um, condition remains stable, slightly improved, denies any pain relief, denies any new complaints during transport, also unable to provide EMS with any more specific details about where or what it was, did, did provide some more detail to at least to fire saying that yeah, he had TB and he was supposed to be taking medicine, but he wasn't taking the medication. And uh, the, long, lo the long and short, you know, here's his, vi his initial blood pressure is only 60 over 37. You have to, but his pulse, curiously, is 90. And they, he's not taking any significant medications to reduce that. So that may have been a spurious. If it's a trauma, you would have bet on it, but in a, in a uh, you know, there's no reason they should have a pulse of 90. Um, um, blood glucose, 192. Pulse ox, 100%. Also kind of makes you think, well, maybe it's not. And this is on room air. Uh, then now recheck, blood pressure, 106 over 60. Pulse, 82. <clears throat> He's got the pain. His lungs, lungs were, quote, clear in all fields. Tuck that one away. Uh, he got his ondansetron, uh, pulse ox is 98%. Uh, anyway, he was transported, and uh, because he was coughing a little bit, well, it's not noted too much, and, uh, the, and with the history of tuberculosis, the fire filled out a uh, possible exposure. And the nice thing about that is that 
we get to then dig into it and get further when you have that sort of thing going on. Um, so, uh, indeed, his, here's his past history. Um, in earlier this year, he was treated for uh, uh, C. diff colitis, uh, which is usually an effect of taking, or often the effect of taking antibiotics inappropriately. And uh, that probably was the case. We didn't know, we didn't know where he was treated for that, but they did note tuberculosis in the discharge summary. He had a history of tuberculosis while living in Mexico in 2010, got medical treatment there. In 2015, he underwent lobectomies with at least the left lower lobe lobectomy for aspergillosis, which is a, which is a fungal infection. And aspergillosis actinomyces, so, uh, and they found during his second thoracotomy. So he had two thoracotomies, removed some segmental lobes. Uh, overall, his course was complicated by hemoneumothorax. He had been transferred to OHSU for that and treated that. Ultimately, in 2017, in June, admitted to Peace Health for left lower lobe pneumonia. Uh, sputum was, uh, uh, smear was negative for tuberculosis, but eventually did grow a uh, a type of tuber what, what was thought to be tuberculosis, and it was put on four drug treatment because it was thought to be a resistant tuberculosis. He was put on INH, rifampin, uh, ethambutol, and pirazomid, which is a, which is the four-drug combination for resistant tuberculosis. But then, the state failed to from this sample that had grown out TB. They failed to isolate any TB DNA, so they didn't think it was. So he said, "Well, this isn't TB. This is just." another funky looking uh, indolent slow growing bacteria and they said he doesn't really have TB so don't worry about it he doesn't need to be on treatment anymore so uh, that at least went through that part but what did he have he had pneumonia which gives you abdominal pain and chest pain often Matter of fact, one of the most common confusion, at least in the old days, before thing, the common confusions of children presenting with right lower quadrant, right-sided abdominal pain, um, instead of ha and then an elevated white count, and say, "Well, we're going to have to go for their appendix." Turns out that they we always had to, you know, you always would fail if you didn't get a chest x-ray because the kids often had right lower lobe pneumonia which is then the pain is referred to the right lower quadrant from the liver okay second case this is fascinating as this one worked out this patient was in a swim portion of a triathlon she was a cancer survivor and this is a cancer survivor the cancer um, you know one of these things to raise money for cancer awareness and all that. So she's in the swim portion. She's in her 60s. She's, she called for help and a, a small rescue boat, this, the tag-along boat, pulled her from the water. She was complaining of shortness of breath, had crackles in all fields, according to the people on the rescue boat. Um, they said she was blowing a little pink fluid at that point. So the rescue boat pulled her from the water and transported her to the side where, where our crews fire and uh, AMR pick her up. Uh, short of breath, crackles on all fields, low O2 sats, CPAP was started. She was not improving with this. Uh, uh, she, said, she told them through her one or two word sentences that she'd had pulmonary edema in the past and that's all the information they could get. She was tachypnic. CPAP was being was put on her when uh, AMR uh, by by fire. 
standby crew of volunteers put the put her on a gurney from the small boat. Um, transport crew was was told to set up for RSI just in case she had crackles, pink frothy fluid coming out of her nose and mouth, poor vasculature. Plus she's been in the water, and so she's kind of cold. Um, IV attempts were unsuccessful, so an IO was done. Uh, they first attempted to do a NASCAR type approach, but they couldn't visualize the cords, put her supine, had a large epiglottis, couldn't see it, so they dropped the eye gel. She went bradycardic. Big surprise, what's the number one cause of bradycardia when you're trying to do an RSI? Hmm? Hypoxia. Hypoxia is what makes everybody Brady down. That's why the little babies get hypox you know, they get hypoxic at birth. They're Brady you start doing ventilations and oxygen first. CPR uh, was started immediately as she went to a systole despite atropine twice. Um, uh, might have, in retrospect, uh, at that point, I'm inclined to think maybe epinephrine might be the best thing to pop up the, pop up the, the heart rate at that point. Uh, CPR was started immediately. Uh, ACLS drugs. She was PEA. Pulses were regained, then lost. Then she had strong pulses. She had an ROSC <coughs> at the time she hit the hospital. 12 leads showed sinus tack with a right bundle branch block. It actually was atrial fibrillation, but it's really fast. Uh, patient required multiple suctioning throughout. Uh, copious fluid coming up. Patient was breathing on her own by the time she got to the hospital. There's the stuff. She got a, a typical and a good, actually her CO2 value wasn't bad at the time they um, Intubated it with that much pulmonary edema, it might have been not correct. I mean, not really interpreted as being correct because there's not, there wasn't much CO2, CO2 exchange. Um, and she was intubated with etomidate and sucks. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that with the CPAP on, she might have, it, she, it might have been good to try her on, you know, if, if they had the time, if they had the thought process to give her a little ketamine at the time to, to, to sedate her during the CPAP process, and then if that didn't work, go right to ketamine, which might have been a better drug for this. Then the next CO2 value is 14. That's probably not too accurate either, probably too good. Um, and then on and on and on, and she ultimately did get some epinephrine and, uh, and, and stuff during her, uh, during her resuscitation. CO2 value popped up to 68, so I think you're winning at that point. You're now, you're, you're, you're showing that she's actually now probably starting to uh, uh, exhale a little CO2. And she got some sodium bicarb, which is reasonable in this case. Now, in the hospital, difficult case. She was the flash pulmonary edema, missed tube, cardiac arrest with ROSC, uh, difficult to ferret out, managed all that. I think it went really, really, really well, all things considered. Now, I wrote this the day after she was admitted. I have since followed that. I didn't give Mark the follow-up, which I should have. Um, she, uh, she was in the ICU two days. On the second day, she, was, oh, she also had um, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, uh, which has now been treated. Uh, she was she was extremely acidotic on arrival. pH was less than seven. That was despite the bicarb that was given on the way in. So she got more good bicarb. She got ventilation assistance with sedation for about a day, and then she and by the third day she was up walking around saying she was going to have to wait a little while, and she wanted to do another triathlon. Um, maybe just contribute money to the. <laughs> 
<laughs> it would probably work out better. But she did. Uh, it was a, it was a great it was a great. Everything worked out well for her, and for the crews. It's really kind of fun that the that I mean I don't think the chase boat really expected they'd pull someone out. They're there to try to pull people out who are drowning, not drowning internally, which is what she was doing. Okay. For. Uh, yeah, it was negative. negative. Yeah, yeah. She just had pulmonary edema. Yeah, and probably secondary to rapid. It's AFib with RVR while she was in the stressing swimming portion. That's the first part of the race. Right? Yeah. Well, ordinarily it is. Yeah, I know. And and they do it for that reason. They don't want people. They don't want people drowning in the third part of the race. You know, <laughs> it is a tough start. She probably she probably is not going to make the make the you know, the, the cut for uh, Iron Man this year. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Four-year-old patient, limp cyanotic, not tracking, with swelling and redness to cheeks and drooling upon arrival. Patient had a pediatric non-rebreather placed. Upon patient contact, patient with limp when EMS picked him up with cyanosis around the lips and nail beds and drooling. EMS looked inside patient's mouth and didn't see anything. Per patient's father, he was driving him to the hospital when he saw an ambulance on the side of the road and pulled over to get help. This man has never heard of a cell phone. So, father was doing yard work. His, his in the backyard, his son came out drooling and unable to breathe. Patient father tried turning the patient upside down, did back blows because he thought the patient was choking. Then he said he vomited, but he thinks he might have inhaled some vomit. Patient's father was asked to see if the, asked, uh, medics looked and said, his cheeks look a little red and swollen compared to how normal he is, how he is normally. His dad said, well, yeah, maybe so. Okay, red and swollen. Remember, this kid is, you know, is drooling and gasping for breath. Had strider, drooling, tightness, and inspiratory and expiratory wheezes in all fields. Patient placed on a, med, a nebulizer, gave him some IM diphenhydramine and IM epinephrine, con calculated uh, weight. Transported emergently to Peace Health, became more alert, cyanosis disappeared, patient's drooling improved, started acting more appropriately, still had strider and wheezes, patient's cheeks were less red and swollen, turned over, transferred care to the pa physician in RN. So here's his stuff. He's got GCS is 12, pulse 156, <laughs> respiratory effort 16, fatigue, got albuterol, diphenhydramine, epinephrine, pulse oxygen. I think he turned over to you. I think this came to you. <laughs> this to me is a classic case of not following all your history clues. Why is this kid, what, what are, why do we think this kid is having an allergic reaction? He was in the house, according to dad, eating. Dad went outside. Mom is not in the house. Kid comes out choking, coughing, drooling. It's when he's, not, he's got strider. We don't know if suction was applied. I didn't, I didn't read it. Uh, redness of the face seemed maybe to suggest allergic reaction, but what other signs of allergic reaction do we have there? Um, so when the doc, and it happened to be Marty, looked in his hypopharynx with the laryngoscope, we found a quarter-sized piece of sausage, which he removed, and the kid immediately got better and went home. <laughs> yeah, I didn't use a laryngoscope. I just used a tongue blade. Just used a tongue blade and looked in there. Yeah, you got to look down there. Yeah. huge piece of meat. little kid, you know? Okay. Let's see. So he was managing his airway at that point. I think the... Probably had come loose. 
yeah. helped out, and then, and then, and then probably you know I, I, I'm I'm thinking that the. I guess that, I didn't get a, a sense of all those that, that he came in by ambulance. I can't, yeah, I he did. That. I thought he came in by yeah. rescue. Nope. So, you know, he's getting better, and there were, uh, probably with the with the uh, epinephrine and the albuterol and stuff, he he gets a little bit of decrease of if there was any edema, and he might have been able to get it out. There was a very similar. <laughs> this, uh, esophagus. It had been, you know, in the proximal esophagus, just pressing on the back of the of the uh, of the airway, and the kids, the airways are so supple that you know the pressure oh. from that can just completely include it. Yeah. Okay, code three and a fall. Oh no, this is a this boy, th this is such a this is such a great community for pathology I mean if you if you if you really are into if you're really into the uh, uh, in the emergency business and like being an emergency doctor this is you never see you, see, you never see anything like this in any in any place I've ever been arrived at the address given on a fall but we met at the door by a person who said there's no emergency here why are you guys here okay so they press through anyway Eventually, found a patient in the backyard. This is a small commercial nursery operation. We don't know what they're growing. Uh, that happens to have a large structure in the backyard. It's about a, it's a multi-level, it looks like a, they, they were described by fire as a multi-level confidence course tower or a fire department training tower. It's pretty big. And the patient was sunbathing, drinking mimosas, <coughs> on the upper deck, which is four stories up, when she fell. What she did was she stepped through the hole where the ladder comes up and went bumpity, bumpity, bump all the way to the bottom, hitting, uh, hitting the lower deck, probably hitting the, the ladder, impacting the ground ultimately. On arrival, unconscious, non-responsive, respiratory rate 32, shallow, Skin pale, warm, dry, patient uh, pulse thready, rapid, pupils uneven, not reactive, bleeding about the mouth, several teeth missing, nose appeared to be clear, bleeding and swelling from the right ear, abrasions to the right side of the face, chest wall feels stable with equal rise and fall, right side of the chest is abraded, pelvis, uh, abdomen soft, pelvis feels intact, extremities appear to be okay, multiple bruises and stuff, mostly on the right side. AMR medic began to prepare for RSI. They applied C the fire applied C collar, a log rolled patient to long backboard, secured with spider straps, moved to IV, uh, moved to MICU. IV started, transported on the way toward Peace Health EKG. As they're getting ready to RSI, she started groaning, became lucid, complained of pain all over, but chief complaint was leg pain. Now alert and oriented times four. Blood pressure rose from 60 to 92. RSI was placed on hold. The second IV placed. Patient care transferred to ED physician. So they're, they're en route and they decided to abort the, the, the RSI. Appropriate to hold on the intubation because en route, if she seemed to be more stable and she was lucid at that point, but she was emergently intubated in the ED because she was in shock. She had obvious head, chest, abdominal injuries, and that's my comment, she's a mess. She had multiple facial fractures, many of them, uh, uh, some open mostly, but a lot, of, a lot of facial stuff to do. But they were, uh, she had non-neural threatening cervical fractures, meaning they were all posterior elements, they weren't involving the, 
um, the cords itself. Uh, a burst fracture of T4, which is a bit of a problem, uh, because that could, could do some neurologic damage. Multi-rib fractures, major laceration of the left lower lobe, which required it. She had a massive hemothorax, which is why her blood pressure was initially low, which also shows the thing that the initial blood pressure is still the one that the, that the trauma surgeons should bet on. She's in shock. She needed to, you know, that's a ma major sign there. Um, her massive, her, her laceration of her lower lobe was so much, she had to re they had to resect the lower lobe to get the stop bleed. You couldn't just fix it. Couldn't just patch it. They had to take that, that segmental section out. She had a total, total splenic laceration with a hemoperitoneum. She had to have splenectomy too. So this is my note after the thing. She was intubated, sedated. She had a lot more surgery coming, face, uh, probably a, maybe even a stabilization of that burst fracture, I don't know, or, or a decompression of that. She had massive transfusion protocol, which means she got more than a couple of units of blood. Uh, she's 30-ish. Yeah. 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 And who was the and who was the person who said there's no patient here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here is another fun one. Dispatch code three on an approximately 25 year old female actively seizing on a C Tran bus. VFD is on scene. AMR is writing this part. Uh, a, uh, VFD is giving 2.5 versed IM. Family said rider who witnessed C a seizure stated patient has been seizing for about 20 minutes before VFD got there. Family contacted mother via the phone. The mother states the patient's 25 weeks pregnant. So another complication. So approximately 25-year-old female, right ladder on floor bus, actively seizing, despite the 2.5 of Versed IM, which is a little bit on the low dose IM. Uh, I would have given her five as a minimum. Uh, Rolled to mega mover, moved to gurney, en route to MICU, patient appears to be vomiting with foamy spittle leaking from mouth. Once in MICU, IV established, 2.5 versed given IV. Patient continued to vomit. Decision to intubate was made. Patient continued apparently to seize. So we got midazolam, GCS, got midazolam, blood glucose is okay, pulse ox is okay, CO2 value is 21. Uh, think about that one for a minute. Uh, pulse ox is 100%. Got some magnesium sulfate, got two grams over three to four minutes. Um, reasonable under the circumstances, thinking, of course, that is this eclampsia, toxemia. Uh, got some automatate sucks, intubated, intubated well. Okay, CO2 value is 21. Now, I know what's coming, so I can, I can look at this and say, gee, you know, here's a patient who's been seizing for 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, and the, she has a low CO2 and a normal O2. That doesn't make good sense to me. I mean, you do that if you're hyperventilating. Well, we keep going on here. So she gets more, she gets midazolam after the thing. And, and now her CO2 is, uh, after intubation, her CO2 is, pops up to 44 and O2 is still 100 and everything is normal. Huh, just, so 
This is a rather bizarre case. We've checked in on this young lady. She has non-epileptic seizures. She does not have any seizure activity during her very obvious and very well presenting seizures. But there's no brain, abnormal brave wave activity whatsoever during the seizures, quote unquote. She's had 88 ED visits this year just in the Peace Health System, <laughs> up and down the coast. She's been intubated on several occasions, so we're not the only ones. She is pregnant, which only, only gives us room to think about, about Darwinian mechanisms <laughs> here and things, but she has had no history of eclampsia. Frankly, she's a little early. She's not, she's just getting into the third trimester, so that would be early for eclampsia, but I don't expect that to happen. She woke up in the ED, she was extubated, and she says, I wanna go home. So we have tagged her for, you know, I don't expect you guys to diagnose pseudo seizures. So if she's seizing or appears to be seizing, treat her for that. You can give her some Versed, transport her, but try not to intubate her. Try not to RSI, because we'll get in trouble sooner or later. Just, uh, just a note, though, we haven't literally tagged her. <laughs> yeah. her <laughs> so. Uh, I, I believe this is the one that popped up in Skamania County, and she's uh, 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 about a year ago when I was covering Skamania County for, for Dr. Hoskins. And uh, I mean, she really has really good pseudo seizures. She refuses she refuses psychiatric intervention, and this is the only thing that's wrong. So apparently, she'd rather have intubation than psychiatric in, uh, intervention. And I somehow I don't think being a mom is going to help this out at all. <laughs> okay, that's the last one. Actually, we're fairly early today. Get yourself a little break. Um, one of the things on, uh, just for your so you're aware of it because it, uh, uh, we, 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 we didn't get a chance to get, put it into the, um, the order changes that we did in, in uh, August, but uh, you, you have Ondansetron now, Sofran, available as an oral form. So for the people you don't, so it, I mean it should be on all your regs soon. So it's, uh, it's Use it the same way we use IV. It's a it's eight it's eight milligram dose, which I go with. So it's, so that's two of them, and these are orally dissolving. They don't swallow these suckers. They stick them up. They stick them under your tongue or in the in the cheek pouch and let them dissolve. And, it's, and the, for those cases of mild nausea, nausea that you don't want to start an IV on. I get. I think the ALS person would have because if they're not, if they don't respond to it, and you think it's important enough to treat them, you know that 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 that's the decision of the PIC. Um, and you know because there's no IV, theoretically, yeah, that would be okay. But you know, use your judgment. You know, it depends on how 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 anxious you are about coming to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no pressure though, no stress. No, no, it's the same thing, but you can have it in the cheek pouch too to do the same thing. You can stick it under the tongue, it's just, you know, it's hard for people to keep something under the tongue often. And one of the problems with 
with people who are nauseated that sometimes they're a little bit dry mouth. You may just give them a little, a, a little bit of water to slop around in their mouth. To, but they're not supposed to swallow the pill. It's supposed to dissolve. That works pretty well. So, okay. Uh, next mark is uh, skills. Uh, well, I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you more on Thursday. No, on Thursday, I guess.